that is beautiful. I think about heaven with that song, and I think about the Lord saying he would not have part of this table until he does again with us in the kingdom. And I got to tell you, as that last verse was going, I was thinking about how I want to give a hug to my dad and so many others by that sea of glass. And what Jesus has done has given us that hope and that blessed assurance. So I'm glad you've come to join me today at the table of the Lord's Supper. Let's begin with prayer. Our Father God, I want to thank you for the beauty of the day, but the beauty of the day cannot outmatch the beauty of your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done. Lord, he is our Passover. And as you freed Israel of old through the blood of a lamb, as you gave them unleavened bread, today we will take the emblems that Jesus said had been pointing forward to him, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Lord, we know that when we come to you, we come and you give us opportunity and there are needs for decision. May your Holy Spirit work within our hearts that we will answer aright in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. That's a lot of baskets. And the question today is, Lord, is it I? I'd like for you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the 26th chapter, as our homily as we think on the upper room. So enter the upper room through Matthew chapter 26. We'll begin in verse 20 and we'll go through verse 25. And this is what it says in the New King James. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The son of man indeed goes just as it is written about him, as it is prophesied of him, of Messiah. But woe to the, that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, exclamation mark. I want you to remember who's speaking, Jesus, the Lord of the world, the one giving his life to save everyone he can. And when Jesus says something like this, we should take no. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for him, that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, you have said it. You know, sometimes we come to scriptures that are so familiar that they can blind us to things. We know them so well by rote that we sometimes miss a detail. And for me this week, it has been so. I mean, even my title, it's Lord, is it I? And uh, this morning I woke up and it was like, hold it. You know, I grew up with the King James and so much of scripture was, and I remember everyone's asking, Lord, is it I? And when we got to Judas, he says, master, and that sounds pretty good. But I went to the Greek this morning and I looked at what the other disciples asked and what, what Judas asked, and I think there's something profound to it. The disciples, you, they ask, Lord, is it I? And the Greek word for what Judas asks is, Rabbi, is it I? Along the road to Jerusalem in the upper room, along the three and a half year journey of Jesus and those 12 disciples, he had warned them time and again. And once he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they said, they say, you're this, or you're John the Baptist, or you're this. And he said to them, who do you say I am? And Peter made it very clear. He said, you are the Christ. And you Christians, what we need to know is that is not Jesus' surname. That is the title of Messiah, son of God and king. And so we come to the upper room, and he says, one of you will betray me. And the other 11 say, use the word curiae, Lord, is it I? 
But when it comes to Judas, he uses the word rabbi, teacher. So maybe some of the answer is in his question. Because Jesus is more than a rabbi, so you need to let him be more than a rabbi. He is Lord. Rabbi, is it I? You have said what he means in your actions, in your deeds. He could read the heart. He knew what Judas had been doing and planning. You have said. I say to you today that Judas should have kept his greedy little power-hungry hand out of that dish. I was attending a special meal being held in our nation's capital. Since I was one of the honored guests, a uh, hostess asked me to be one of the first in line. That's unusual for a preacher, so I took the opportunity. The only time you're first in line is your first time at a church, and then you shall be last because the first shall be last. I remember I was going through line, and there's another pastor, and I saw him recently. It's probably why this is on my mind. Um, Elder Dunbar Henry, who had pastored with my dad in Tacoma Park, Maryland, when I was in seminary, he was at that funeral that I had, and, and it brought a lot of memories. And so Dunbar Henry, uh, this wonderful guy, preacher, he came, and he was on the other side. We took our plates. We made, they were actual plates. We made our way down to tables laden with exotic delicacies. We... Who could have imagined two pastors being led the way at a capital meal? I remember we were opposite each other. We made our way through line, remarking to each other how good the food looked and smelled. Something I could say back then, and I, I only go by faith now after COVID. Neither of us knew anything about the food that we were choosing, and a hostess literally walked beside us, telling us what the different foods were and explaining something about them. This was new to me. We pastors, honored guests, front of the line. Sounds impressive, more impressive than it was. It was a fellowship lunch at my dad's church. It was in the capital because Tacoma Park is across the street, the church is, it's in Maryland, and across the street's the offices and fellowship hall, and it's in the District of Columbia. And it was a special fellowship lunch because many in my dad's church were from Indians, and they were having a meal to honor all the pastors and their families, and Indians know how to honor, I'm going to say, and they know how to cook. It wasn't a fellowship lunch. It was a feast. I've been to fellowship lunches that were a fast. <laughs> I'm a PK. I've been a president. I learned to start bringing a sack lunch when I drive all around Ohio in case the potluck was so bad, I would at least not starve to death before getting home. I'm glad we have blessed fellowship lunches, but this was remarkable. Fancy dinnerware, I mean, everything's fancy. And the hostess is walking and explaining to the pastor and I what the different foods were. And, and there we were, enjoying ourselves. And, and as we went about the middle of the table, halfway down in the middle, was this little crystal bowl with a tiny spoon in it. We got to it, and Pastor Dunbar, as I always call him, he grabbed the little spoon, and he started putting this stuff on his food, and, and the woman said, oh, no, no, Pastor, no. That is very hot. My friend, being the proud American preacher that he was, said, that's okay, I like it hot. <laughs> Not to be outdone, I took the little spoon, I started dumping it on like it was Parmesan cheese, and the woman looked at us painfully. I remember the look, so I'm towering over. I'm looking down, and she's looking through painful eyes, saying, oh, Pastor, no, no, this is very, very hot. Not wanting them to think that we American preachers couldn't handle hot food, we smiled patronizingly down at her and said, we like it hot. <laughs> we wondered why this tiny bowl for such a large group, we would soon find out. We made our way because here's what happened. She left us. She kind of backed off with a pain look and like, I warned you. And then she went and talked to some. We could hear them. We couldn't understand them. They're talking in some Indian dialect and they're looking at us and pointing. A man came up and he said to us, pastors, Let's take these plates from you. Start again. That is very, very hot. 
Oh, we stubbornly dug our heels in, not wanting them to think we were wimps. We said, we like it hot. We can take hot. He backed away and let us go, shaking his head and noticed them still talking and watching. They kept watching us. We went to our table. We sat across from each other. We could feel all the eyes of the place on us. And we gave a look to each other. didn't say a word, but the look said, I do not care how hot this is. We will not flinch. We will eat this. And they will learn that American preachers can eat hot Indian food. They just don't know our fire eating capabilities. We wanted this and we were about to get it. Boy, were we about to get it. We should have kept our hands out of that little bowl. We should have listened to all the warnings along the way. We should have got new plates because it was hot curry with Parmesan, not Parmesan cheese on top. We weren't going to just take a little bit of this. We were going to show them what we could do. So we took our forks, and they actually had forks, not plastic forks where you break it and you're like, oh my, you know, you know how it can be, men. We took heaping helpings of hot Indian curry with powder all over it, with everybody watching. We put it in our mouths, and it was immediate. Our hosts hadn't been exaggerating. They had been underestimating, if anything. It went from, oh, look at us, we can handle it, to a three-alarm fire like that. It didn't just burn our mouths. It was burning down our throats and into our stomachs. I didn't know this was possible. I'd had ghost peppers. This was like ghost pepper to the 10th power. It, and it was building. It wasn't stopping. We're trying not to show what this is doing to us, but we're starting to choke and cough. We grab glasses of water. We down them in one gulp. We started grabbing other people's glasses of water. We hoped they hadn't started, but we could care less at this point. We are on fire. The fires of judgment had hit us. I looked at him. I'd never seen this before or since. Tears were literally shooting out of his eyes like... Water guns were spray. It was literally shooting. But none of our tears could quench the fires of hell. People were coming up to us trying to help us, but there was no help for the wicked. They were trying to tell us, their, uh, oh, yogurt works. Who brings yogurt to a fellowship lunch? We're dead. We are dead. And we're going to be in a lot of pain on our way out. We put ice blocks, well, they weren't blocks, but we wanted, they were, you know, blocks in our mouths, and it couldn't stop it, it just melting them. There was one thing of milk in the refrigerator, don't even know if it was old or not, we just grabbed it, we're guzzling milk, it wouldn't put it out, nothing would put out the fires of hell, it was too late, too late, sinner. They were being so nice, our hosts, they could have laughed at us, they could have said, we warned you crazy American preachers, they could have said. We told you, but you wouldn't listen. We left the room on fire. We wanted to do our crying outside. They didn't yell out, we warned you. We told you crazy guys how bad this was. They weren't vengeful. They were painfully sorry. And we were too. We were so sorry for what we had chosen, for ignoring the warnings. We were sorry, but it was too late. I've come today to a table to say that not heeding warnings at special sacred meals can be disastrous. Not listening to your host's warnings at special meals can get you burned, like in meals held in the capital like in a meal of spiritual gathering in an upper room, like communion in Jerusalem. Sometimes dipping into the wrong bowl is more than you can handle. Isn't that right, Judas? One after one says, Lord, is it I? It comes to Judas, Rabbi, is it I? And all these years I 
Oh, Judas, he's the clever one. Smarter than your average disciple. I mean, maybe one of the brightest of all the 12, but he is too smart for his own good. Don't be that in your spiritual life. Not listening to your heavenly hosts is dangerous. He smiles patronizingly. He had been warned and warned and warned, but he knows better than Jesus. He can take the heat. He's got his own ideas. He's got his own plan. He's going to have to eat and run. He's going to show them that he can take the heat. He knows what he's doing, but there are some fires too hot to play with. And he has been stoking the fires of hell in the depths of his soul now for a while. How did he, this happen to him? It happened one shallow decision after another. He, he didn't wake up one morning just to say, Rabbi, is it I? It happened over month after month of not listening to the Holy Spirit's call on his heart, hardening it just like Pharaoh had before Passover. It had been a slow burning fire and soon it will explode. It will explode in brilliant red against the black ink night of his stubborn heart. And when it does, nothing is going to put it out. Not even throwing 30 pieces of silver on top of it will smother it. Not even a hangman's noose it will be unable to change his mind. You see, like the hostess with us and then the man who came to Pastor Henry and I, they warned and then they saw our decision and they backed away. Because love gives choice. And without choice, it can't be love. And like those hostesses with us, I believe that Jesus had sorrow and pain in his eyes because he knew what Judas was choosing. And he knew what it meant. We have four Gospels, and in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 30, it says of Judas as he left the upper room, and he went out, and it was night. That has always caught me because I think it means more than it was dark outside. I think John had captured the truth of it. He went out, and it was night, not just out there, but inside the heart of Judas. You see, Judas leaves the table without learning from it. He will learn the table lessons too late. He will learn them somewhere between the garden and the temple, where he will throw those 30 pieces of silver, those coins, into the temple courtyard. And by then, tears will be pouring down his face, but they will not douse the fires he has chosen. And by then, it's too late. So today, we have opportunity. Jesus gives us choice. So today, as your friend and your pastor, I would say, take the cup and drop the coins. Whatever the coins might be. Today, receive the gift, not the guilt. Worship Christ and not yourself. Worship him, don't betray him. Quit trying to set up whatever little earthly kingdom you think you want and follow Jesus. His is a heavenly path and your abundant life is only in following him. Not your own will. Don't be burned by evil desires and don't leave the table early. Enjoy a meal prepared for you with the very blood and body of Jesus Christ. Do not run from it. Often this is called the Last Supper. But what I know from Scripture, it was only the Last Supper for one of those 12. It was the Last Supper of Judas because he left too soon. He left the table before he surrendered. So the lesson today for us is not to leave this table before we have surrendered. For Jesus has paid too much for our salvation. And surrender is the way of joy, peace, and love, and all the things you want. And only Jesus can give them. His way is truly the best. 
Our Father, um, I do not know. But I think that out of all the hard things that happened to Jesus that night, was Judas stubbornly holding on to his self-will and self-way. And then to feel the kiss of betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. So all of us disciples, we have failed. But there's a difference between failure and what Judas did. If we have stubborn hearts, God, I pray your Holy Spirit can melt them. Take our hearts of stone. Make them hearts of flesh. Lord, whatever the world's calling out to any of us, may we hear plainly the call of Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. And before we leave this place, Lord Jesus, I pray that everyone here along with me opens that door, lets you come in, and we eat this supper with you. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen, amen.